So up to multiplicative and additive errors depending on j. In other words, any one of the things on this list I'm, I'm about to write is within j times any other one plus j. Okay? So here it's a list of three things. The first is, oh, so before I say it, I should, I should, I should set this up a little better. So let's say that x and y are any two points in the Teichmuller space of S. So we saw from Ian's talk that uh, if I give a pair of points in the Teichmuller space, then there's some convex co-compact hyperbolic three-manifold that is homeomorphic to the surface cross R, where uh, the sort of conformal uh, structures at, at infinity, one of them is conformal to x and the other is conformal to y. And these are called, this is a quasi-Fuchsian three-manifold, and I guess I'll call it Q of x, y. Okay? So the first, so I guess uh, there's a picture that goes with that, which I'll just draw quickly. I'll, I'll go here. So the picture for Q of x, y, um, so Ian also talked about this. So um, we have some subgroup of the isometry group of hyperbolic 3 space, which I'll call gamma of x, y. And it's acting on, say, a hyperbolic 3 space. And the picture of the action is it, it fixes some, there's some invariant Jordan curve on the boundary sphere at infinity, on which the action of the group is kind of chaotic. Um, if you take the convex hull of this Jordan curve sitting inside of hyperbolic 3 space, then that region of, the, of hyperbolic 3 space, if you restrict the action of gamma to that region, it's a co-compact action. Um, so the region divides the sphere into two parts, uh, a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere on which the group acts properly discontinuously. And the quotient of the group, the quotient of omega plus by the action of the group is conformal to x. And similarly, the quotient of omega minus by the group is conformal to y. Okay? So the picture of the quotient looks something like this. And this is just a cartoon. You have these flaring ends that Ian also drew. And here you have some convex region. So here you have some surface at infinity that looks like x, and here you have some surface at minus infinity that looks like y. And in here, you have a convex region that carries all the topology of the manifold, um, and it's compact since the group acted co-compactly on its preimage and the universal cover. And so this is called the convex core. Okay. So okay, now that that's done, the first of these three quantities is the volume of the convex core of this manifold, q of x, y the volume of the convex core of Q of x, y. Okay. The second quantity is the distance in the Ve peterson metric between x and y in the Teichmuller space. So the distance in Teichmuller space equipped with the Ve peterson metric between x and y. And the third so I said it had to reference the pants graph explicitly, so here's where that's coming in. The third is the distance in the pants graph between what I'll call p sub x and p sub y. So now I'm really going low here. So p sub x is a Bears pants decomposition on x equipped with its hyperbolic metric, and similarly for p sub y. So this is a, a short pants decomposition on the hyperbolic surface x. And this is a short pants decomposition on the surface y. So um, these are Bears pants decomposition. So there's some constant called the Bears constant that depends on your surface s, so that any hyperbolic surface has a pants decomposition of length at most that constant. And so you pick any one of those pants decompositions for x, any one for y, their distance in the pants graph is related to these other two quantities. Um, so I'm not done with the theorem yet. <laughs> there's, there's a second part of it, which I guess I'll continue here. I'll erase this picture. Yes? Because I guess that if you take each equal 
Yes, yes. Well, f first of all, the, I'm, I'm sweeping something under the... So I, I should really... X and Y should, first of all, really be... W one of them should be in the Teichmuller space uh, of the surface equipped with the opposite orientation. That's first of all. Um, but you're right. I mean, I, I could pick X comma X. And if I do that, then what you're getting is actually the Fuchsian group, just the subgroup of PSL2R, where X, uh, the same surface, is at infinity on both sides. Um, so you're right. And in that case... Yes. Yes. Like this? No. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Um, so okay, there's there's a bit more to this theorem. It's really two separate theorems, but I want to say it all at once. So. So also. Up to j, uh, the following are equal. So now it's a list of two things. The first is the volume of, uh, so I should say, let phi be uh, some pseudo Nasov mapping class. Okay? So um, I can form the mapping torus. For the mapping class phi, the theorem of Thurston tells you that it's hyperbolizable. So there's some complete hyperbolic structure on this manifold. And its volume is the first thing on this list of two. And the second thing is the translation length of phi uh, acting on the pants graph. So that's just the minimum distance that phi moves any vertex in the pants graph. OK, um, okay so that's great. So it's, it's, it tells you it relates the geometry of Teichmuller space, the volumes of hyperbolic 3 manifolds, um, either fibered or quasi-Fuchsian, all to this combinatorial object, this pants graph. Okay, so it's a really nice theorem. And, and the first theorem is also really nice, too. It tells you um, it, it sort of suggests part of an algorithm for um, dealing with the conjugacy problem in the mapping class group. If you have a pair of maps that you happen to already know are pseudo Anasov, then it tells you, okay, just look inside of a ball of this size in the Cayley graph for, the, for a conjugator. If you find it, great. If you don't, they're not conjugate. The problem, one of the problems in both of these theorems is that how this K and how this J grows with the choice of surface is not very well understood. Um, and that sort of limits, to some extent, how applicable they are uh, in applications. So like again, there actually are algorithms for solving conjugacy-like problems in braid groups that call on this very theorem. And if you want to implement an algorithm like that, you, you need to understand what this k is, right? Um, as, for, as for these theorems, I mean, let's just focus on this one. Um, suppose, uh, so if you understood what this constant j was as a function of the, of the topology of the fiber, you'd start to get um, ways of telling fibered manifolds apart. So for instance, suppose I had pseudo Anasov, which I'll call phi sub a. And it's a pseudo Anasov on a genus 10 surface. And I have some pseudo Anasov, which I'll call phi sub b. And it lives on a genus 5,000 surface. And I can form the mapping tori for both of these pseudo Anasovs. And I can ask, are they secretly the same manifold? Uh, metric on them this, the exact same. Is, is one secretly a vibration of the other. And it's actually not that difficult to get information about how phi sub a and phi sub b act on their respective pants graphs. That's a combinatorial object, and there are various formulas and algorithms for getting bounds on what they look like on their pants graphs. So you can assume maybe that we have some information about their actions on their pants graphs. And suppose, suppose the translation length of phi sub a is like 5 and the translation length of phi sub b is like 5 trillion, then you'd like to be able to apply this theorem to say, oh, they're not the same manifold. Their volumes are different. But you can't unless you understand what this j is, right? Because they're living on different surfaces. Um, so OK, so now that hopefully that's a good uh, motivation for the statement of the main theorem. And so this is joint work with Samuel Taylor and Richard Webb. 
theorem is that there exists some computable function. We can write down explicitly what it is, uh, f. Uh, with so we, we, we understand what its growth is. So so f uh, grows at worst factorially. Okay, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a big bound. We're going to talk about sharpness in a minute. Okay, um, and uh, f is an upper bound. F of the Euler characteristic of the surface absolute value is an upper bound on both j and k. Okay, so again, it's a big bound. You somehow sort of you stop the bleeding in some sense. <laughs> there are bigger bounds, but it's not a it's it's a it's a big bound. Um, so it's a constant if it's in big O such as in J or It's not very important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some there are some uh, there are some uniform constants that come in front of here that you know we know what they are. We know what they are. Yeah. Um, okay. So so first of all. Um, before I talk about how sharp are, well, let me just say one thing, which is that kind of the reason why I, I used both of these, I stated both of these two theorems. This is, these two theorems are, are uh, two of kind of uh, many different applications that our main technique works to give effective control for. Um, and that's because what we, what we really do is we give uh, effective estimates for these formulas for measuring distances in the mapping class group and in the pants graph due to Mazur and Minsky. Um, and this is really a testament to how applicable those formulas are. People have used them all over the place. And so now here are two places where they've been used. And if we understand how to effectivize those as a function of the underlying surface, then we can, some, we can't, oh, I mean, our proofs aren't just, you know, they don't just carry through straight away. I mean, there are, there are certain parts of both of these arguments, well, especially this argument, where you know you have to kind of circumvent compactness type arguments, you know, so so the argument is something like, okay, if there's no such J, then you know you're you're moving around in a compact space, so that's a con that's a contradiction somehow, and so you that doesn't that never leads you to any kind of effective result, so we, there there's still some fudging around to do, but our main technique applies to both, and what I will say is that um, what we actually effectivize mainly these distance formulas, we get the same kind of growth. And, and that is actually sharp for the distance formulas, OK? But that doesn't mean that they're sharp for our applications. Um, and actually, I believe that, that this is not sharp, especially for this. And I want to focus in more on, on the volume type theorems. So before I do that, though, talk more about sharpness, I want to talk about connections to other work that's already out there. So connections. So first, there's a theorem of Eagle, which bounds the volume of the mapping torus from above by translation length in the pants graph in a way that's totally uniform. It's, it's, it's some multiplicative constant that doesn't depend at all on the surface. So, so we have first, Eagle tells you that uh, the volume of a mapping torus is at most some uniform constant times the distance in the pants, sorry, times the translation length. I'll just write translation length in the pants graph. And this R is, is, it's basically the volume of a regular ideal octahedron. And it's very explicit. I mean, you sort of, you take your mapping torus and you take a path in the pants graph that connects, um, that, that actually realizes the translation length. And you look at all of the curves that show up on that path and you drill them out of your manifold. And you can explicitly realize that topological object by gluing together these octahedra in the right way that mirrors the moves in the pants graph. And so you get this exact formula. And, and then you have to put the drilled curves back in, but that only makes the volume smaller. So this still works. Um, so that, that's nice. Um, so there's more recent work. Well, first, there's work of Schlenker that relates volume to Ve Peterson in a more explicit way. So um, in the setting of a quasi-Fuchsian three-manifold. So the volume of the convex core of the quasi-Fuchsian three-manifold xy 
is at most uh, the square root of pi times g minus 1, uh, the distance in the Vey Peterson metric between x and y. So this is, I guess, it's, it's stated for closed surfaces where there's just no punctures in genus. Okay? So this is much better than factorial. It's square root. Okay? And there's also some additive constant here, too. That's not hard to understand what it is, but it's something. Okay? Um, and related to this is even more recent work of Kojima McShane and also Brock and Bromberg that get similar bounds but in the setting of, of mapping tori. So Kojima McShane and Brock Bromberg. And I think uh, Jeff will talk about this actually during his talk this week. Um, so they, they give that the volume of the mapping torus is less than or equal to, uh, what is it, 3 square root pi over 2 times the absolute value of the Euler characteristic times the, the Ve peterson translation length. Ve peterson translation of phi. Okay? Um, so one thing you might notice about all of this is that um, all three of these is that you're always bounding volume from above. So bounding volume from above is something that we've known how to do for a bit longer. And even this, this is fairly recent work, both of these. And the techniques here are sort of very interesting um, and unrelated to what we do. Um, but volu bounding volume from below seems to be the harder of the two sides. And so in all three of these cases, we get the other bounds. And of course, the, the constants are much worse. They're factorial or the characteristic as opposed to square root. But that's some of the connections that already appear in the literature. So people have been thinking about these kinds of questions. Um, OK, so now I want to discuss, um, let's see, I need to, I should be thinking more about my board organization at this point. Let's use this one. OK. So I want to sort of state a conjecture about how sharp I think our results are for Brock's theorems. And the short form of the conjecture, not at all. But to be more precise, so conjecture is that the optimal growth for j, this constant j of s, uh, is at least roughly linear in the absolute value of the Euler characteristic and uh, at worst, at most, quadratic. Um, that's my conjecture. I, wanna, I want to uh, convince you that this isn't coming out of uh, the blue sky. Um, this, this is actually not hard to prove, that it has to grow at least linearly. Uh, this, obviously, I can't prove this, because then we'd have a different theorem, a better theorem. But I want to give evidence for this. Okay? So first, why, why, is this, why is this happening? It's exactly the question that was raised. We could, we could just try to take a Fuchsian manifold, so the same point in Teichmuller space on either side. The volume of the convex core is zero in that case. So maybe if we can find a hyperbolic surface admitting two short pants decompositions that are very far apart in that one pants graph, we could get lower bounds for how bad the discrepancy could be in the volume of the convex core versus distance in, in the pants graph. Yes? Sorry, I think it's not very high sure. Yes, yes. Which is like, I can't forget this. It's like, yeah, it's not very, yeah, it's uniform. So is there, supposing you use something like that you have a uh, lower bound on the injectivity ratio. Yes. Okay. Then are there any sort of PDA or set up that, that just very naively move the surface from one side to the other and give you directly a pi? There might, yeah, I mean, there, there are so techniques, yeah, yeah, there, I, I guess I, there's two comments I would make. And there are, like the no, right. 
zero is that there are people in this room who could give you a better answer than I could. Comment one um, is that people do things like this. Um, so there are all sorts of interpolations that occur inside of the convex core. And then as you say, I think it's a theorem of Alfors or something that the, 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 it's directly comparable from the convex core to the conformal boundary to infinity. Um, and, and for instance, I, I think things like shrink wrapping um, can be used in this kind of a context to get the right sort of interpolation. So that, that's something to explore more, which hasn't been explored very much yet. Um, was there a comment too that I was supposed to say? Or did I go through all three comments? I forget. Um, I don't know is really the, the, main, the main answer. Um, but it's a good question. Oh, sorry, I remember. I don't, I, yeah, there's no, there's no reason why that wouldn't work. Yes. Comments, I remember comment two is that when you put a lower bound on injectivity radius, many of these things become comparable um, without much effort. Um, OK. OK, so um, as I was saying, um, if you take uh, a Fuchsian manifold, th so now the key is, can we find a hyperbolic surface admitting two pants decompositions that are both not too long? and which are very far apart in the pants graph. And by very far apart, I mean at least linear in the Euler characteristic. That's what gives you this, this lower bound. And by not too long pants decompositions, I mean less than the Bears constant. And so there's already a bit of ambiguity there because we don't actually know what the Bears constant is. Um, but we have, we have lower bounds for the Bears. Like so Buser, for instance, um, has given examples of hyperbolic surfaces on which every pants decomposition has length at least like g to the power of 3 halves or something. Um, so there exists hyperbolic surfaces um, sg such that uh, every pants decomposition uh, has length at least something like g to the 3 halves. So we can take this to be at least a, a lower bound for the bears decomposite for the bears constant. What, what is the length? Ah, sorry. So, so this is a hyperbolic surface, so it has a metric, and the length of a pants decomposition is just the sum of the lengths of all the geodesic representatives of the curves in that pants decomposition. Okay. Okay. So, as long as I can find a pair of pants decompositions that have length you know, both roughly less than this, and their distances are at least linear in that pants graph, then I win. And so here's a little picture. Here's a big surface. I can't count to more than four, so that's genus four is big. Um, here's, here's one pants decomposition, the same one I drew before. Okay, And the second pants decomposition Will will be uh, so on each on each of these on each of so this is a this is a torus with one boundary component. Here's a four hold sphere. Here's a four hold sphere. Here's a torus with one boundary component. Okay, and so on these four pieces, I can draw a curve that you know winds around some fixed number of times, maybe maybe you know three times, and and goes like that, right? And I can do the same thing here. Um, you know, winds around lots of times, three. Same thing, same thing. For as many of these chunks as I see, if I choose you know, a uniform upper bound on how many times they wind around, then I can easily find a hyperbolic surface on which both the blue and the white curves are not very long. So in total, the length of the blue pants decomposition, all told, will be roughly linear in G. And the length of the white pants decomposition, all told, will be roughly linear in G. But the, the distance in the pants graph um, will, will, will add linearly for each of these chunks. Um, so again, the distance in the pants graph is linear, and, and I get what I was looking for. Does that make sense? OK. The blue pants decomposition is going gonna, it's, it's gonna to share these white separating curves also. It's just going to, uh, and there's, there are other curves. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, there, there are curves I'm not drawing. Yeah. OK. OK, so now I want to give some evidence for, for where this comes from. OK, so um, if you're looking for ways to test what is uh, the discrepancy between volume and pants distance, then one place to look 
is inside of a fibered face of a, of a fibered three manifold. So there you have, so you have this whole story. Um, I guess I should say a couple of words about it. Um, you take a, so if you take a, a hyperbolizable fibered three manifold whose first Betty number is at least two, then the theorem of Thurston is that actually it fibers in infinitely many ways and you can organize some of these, you can organize the vibrations with respect to a norm on the second homology. Um, and uh, the, the unit ball in that norm is some rational polytope in the second homology and a cone over one of the sides of that, of that polytope either consists of all so all of the all of the integral points in that cone are either all fibered monodromies or not. So when they're fibered, you get what's called a fibered face. Um, and the reason why I want to restrict to thinking about fibered faces is because that's where we have some tools for studying what's going on. So again, basically what I want to do is consider an infinite class of pseudo Anasovs that you know that live on different surfaces. But if I form the mapping tori, it's all the same hyperbolic manifold. So the volume is the same for all of them. So uh, if I can control how the pants translation lengths depend on the topology of those fibers, then I'll get some evidence. You know, so suppose I knew that over a fibered face, um, the pants translation length is always at most a quadratic function of the topology of that fiber. So that's what I want to convince you of is, is more or less true. OK, um, everyone see what's happening? Um, OK, so um, for this, I want to introduce uh, a really beautiful construction due to a number of people. But I, I want to give Agel's version of it. So this is called the Veering Triangulation. Um, and it exists when, just to make my life easier also. So let's let, let phi uh, be a pseudo Anasov on a surface S. And we're going to assume that all of the singularities of the, of the uh, invariant foliation for phi uh, uh, coincide with punctures of the surface S. So all singularities of phi are at punctures of S. Okay. So what Egel does um, is in this context, you can take uh, a train track on the surface that carries the attracting lamination of your pseudo Anasov. Uh, so here you have some, here's a little cartoon of your train track, whatever it might look like, I don't know, okay? But since you are in the context where um, all of the singularities of your map are at punctures, you, you know the, the foliations are kind of dual to this picture. So e there's a puncture basically in each complementary region of this train track. OK? Um, and so you can form a sort of dual graph where the vertices are punctures. And these are going to be sort of arcs that go from puncture to puncture. And you get an ideal triangulation of your surface by just connecting over. You connect two regions that share a branch over their boundary of the train track. Um, and the, and, the, and the, the basic fact is that if I take this train track and I perform what's called a splitting of this of this edge, this maximal edge. So I break it up like this. And again, I look at the corresponding dual triangulation. Then it corresponds to doing a diagonal flop, a diagonal flip move on, on this on the triangulation you started with. Okay? So what Egel proves is that you can choose the splittings of this train track in, in the right way to guarantee that um, if you split according to this recipe, you'll eventually end up with a train track that's related to what you started with by the action of the pseudo Anasov. And you can interpret each of these flip moves as being a tetrahedron that you're adding onto the, on top of this triangulated surface, right? And so you glue all these tetrahedra on in the right spots, and, and because you chose the right way to split, eventually you glue back up and you, and you, you, can, you can get a triangulation of the whole mapping torus. Okay. Um, 
So the kind of remarkable fact, um, one of the remarkable facts, is that this triangulation that you ended up with, it's a topological triangulation of this three manifold, and it relied, you know, a priori very heavily on our choice of pseudo Anasov. But the fact is that if I choose any two pseudo Anasovs in the same fibered face, I get the same combinatorial triangulation by doing this procedure. So it's really an invariant of the face. Okay. Um, Okay, so why do I care that it's an invariant of the face? Well, um, what that tells you is, so, so how did triangulation? We got it, um, it's, so associated to the triangulation is this sequence of flip moves, right? Um, so there's, there's another graph, so I'll call it script F of S, and this is the flip graph of S. So vertices are ideal triangulations, ideal triangulations, and edges are exactly these diagonal, diagonal flips. So associated to, to this triangulation is a path in the flip graph of the surface that connects a triangulation to its image under the action of that pseudo-Anasov. Right? That's what it means to say that this eventually glues up and gives you a triangulation of the, of, the, of the three manifold. And so the bottom line is that since this triangulation is an invariant of the fibered face, in particular, any two uh, of these veering triangulations I form for different maps in the fibered face have the same number of tetrahedra. Right? So that means that the path in the flip graph you're getting in each of these surfaces has the same length. So if this was the pants graph instead of the flip graph, I'd just be done. And I'd have a bound that doesn't depend at all on the Euler characteristic of the fiber. It would just be uniform. But it's not the flip graph. It's the pants graph. And so now you can convince yourself. I, I guess I, I won't do it now. But there's sort of an easy way to, to transform a triangulation into a pants decomposition. And there's, there's, there's a, sort of a map from the flip graph to the pants decomposition, which increases distances by no bigger than this kind of a factor. Okay, that's where this comes from. Okay, so um, that's nice. Um, in the remaining time, I guess what I'd like to do is uh, talk more about um, the main tool that we use, uh, sort of a, a, the, uh, the effectivizing these these distance formulas for measuring distance in the pants graph and in the mapping class group due to Mazur and Minsky that we use um, in all of these applications. Okay. So for that, I need to first state the original theorem, which I won't do in its complete generality since that will take too long. I'll just state it in a very limited context. So the main tool is an effective version of measuring distance in the pants graph via what are called subsurface projections. So this is a very useful tool for kind of decomposing what's going on in the pants graph by looking at the curve graphs of various subsurfaces. So there was a picture, which I think is still there. I didn't erase it yet. Here's this picture. That was really well done by me, just having it right there. Um, so here's this, <laughs> here's this picture um, in, on this surface. And I, I didn't say why it was true, but I just sort of stated that the distance between um, these two pants decompositions in the pants graph is just it basically the, the distance in each of these chunks will just add together. Okay? So there's a much more general uh, set of tools that allows you to argue something similar. You can sort of break up the surface into a bunch of chunks that, in this picture, it's particularly nice because the chunks don't crash through each other. 
But I mean, maybe the chunks, the subsurfaces that you're worried about, they kind of intersect in various ways. But the point is, is that you can measure distance in the pants graph by looking at what's happening in the curve graphs of subsurfaces. So um, first, I'll just state what subsurface projection is. So let's just draw a picture of it. So let's say that this genus 2 piece is a subsurface y everything to the left of this curve. okay? And uh, there's a map then. This whole surface is called S. So there exists a map, which I'll call pi y. And it goes from the curve graph of S to the curve graph of y. So what is it? Um, well, first of all, it's not really a map. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, I'll define it this way. So a curve alpha is going to go to, well, there's some possibilities depending on what alpha is. Suppose alpha you know, doesn't intersect your surface y at all. Then we just define this to be empty. Okay? Suppose that uh, alpha lives completely inside of your subsurface. Then we just define this to be alpha. Uh, if alpha intersect y is empty, if alpha intersect y is alpha. Uh, the other possibility, which happens most of the time, is that alpha sort of crashes through y a bunch of times in many, in many different arcs. right? So maybe alpha looks like this, just to give a, a simple picture. Okay? But I mean, really, alpha could run in and out of the surface a thousand times, and you'd get a bunch of arcs on this surface. Then what you do is you choose any one of those arcs, and you just you take it, and you then cut here and serger in one direction along the boundary to get a curve that lives inside of y. Okay? And so there are lots of choices here. So I'll just define this um, to be this operation I did. I'll just write that it means alpha intersect y, this operation where you take an arc and you serger it to get a curve um, otherwise. Okay. Just one, just one. The point is, is that um, for the for the applications we're interested in, everything is going to depend on some some additive and multiplicative constants anyway. So as long as this map is defined up to bounded diameter subsets of both of, the, of both the domain and the target, I don't really care. So if I choose a different arc and do the same construction, the two curves I'll get will be very close together in the curve graph of y anyway, because I mean. If I take some other, so the point is, is that any two arcs that crash through can't intersect, because they all came from the same simple closed curve that didn't intersect itself. And so it's not very hard to sort of serger. If you serger, I mean, maybe the curves will intersect like twice if you, ser if you serger in the wrong way or something. But if curves intersect at most twice or three or four times, their distance in the curve graph can't be very big at most two or three. No, it won't. And, and actually, I'm being a bit sloppy because when, I'm, when I say curve, I really always mean an isotopy class. Yeah, and, and it does nothing, none of this matters on that. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Okay. Okay, so this is what, this is what uh, subsurface projection is. And so the original theorem, due to Mazur and Minsky, this is, this is a bad idea. says that if I have a pair of pants decompositions on the surface, that I can measure their distance by adding up all of the distances of their projections to various subsurfaces. So I didn't say this, but nothing I, in this definition, nothing relies on the fact that I chose a single curve. I could have chosen a multi-curve and done the exact same construction. So in that way, I can define the subsurface projection of an entire pants decomposition. Just choose one component of the pants decomposition and project it. Okay? So um, the theorem says uh, there are constants, let's say C1 and C2, 
depending on the surface, such that the distance in the pants graph between a pair of pants decompositions, P1 and P2, is equal to up to multiplicative and additive errors that depend on the first constant. So that's what this symbol means. Um, the sum over all subsurfaces of your surface S that we're not going to include annuli. They don't, get, they don't get to play. But any other subsurface um, might show up in this sum of the distance in the curve graph of y between the projection of p1 and the projection of p2. So we're not done yet, because first of all, c2 comes up nowhere. And second of all, this sum could be infinite, and that's bad. So what you do is what the theorem actually says is you truncate the sum so that you're only looking at projections who's, which is bigger than, than this constant c2. So that's what this notation means, where, OK, uh, here x c2 means x whenever x is bigger than c2 and 0 otherwise. So it's, it is the case, this is relying on a theorem, that there are only finitely many subsurfaces uh, where the projection of a pair of pants decompositions to those subsurfaces is bigger than some constant. Okay, so I use that constant, I get a finite sum, and that finite sum equals up to errors, this pants distance. So the theorem that we use for these applications is that uh, C2, uh, C2 of s uh, can be taken to be constant. A constant, so it doesn't grow at all with the topology of the surface. And C1 uh, grows at most factorially. So here's where that factorially shows up. At most factorially, uh, and at least exponentially. So maybe 25 minutes ago, I mentioned that while I wasn't sure about the sharpness of our applications, I was more sure about the sharpness of the main tool we use to prove those applications. And so we have lower bounds as well that aren't quite factorial, but they're close. Okay? Um, so in the last like six minutes, um, I'll talk a little bit about, what I want to talk a little bit about is um, how we prove this exponential. How do we know that you know, there's actually some bad discrepancy in this formula as you allow the surface to grow in topology, you can actually get fairly big differences between subsurface projections and pants distance. Um, and the reason why uh, I want to focus more on that is because um, the, the upper bound is m much more technical. I can't really talk about it in six minutes. Um, but also, more sort of interestingly, is that the, the, this, this bound actually also uses uh, some effective control that we get in other areas. That's a very vague and uh, meaningless statement. So I'll just, I'll just describe exactly what I mean. OK, so, so a sort of second theorem is that in the formula I wrote down and probably shouldn't have just erased, there's actually secretly, it's, it's really two inequalities, right? Because it's telling you that there's an equality between, between two things. Uh, up to multiplicative and additive errors. So it's like saying that you know, object one is 
less than or equal to object 2, which is less than or equal to object 1, with, with all the errors in the right spots. Um, so if you just take all of those inequalities together, this is the best we can say. But if you just look at one of the inequalities or the other, then you can say more. So um, the second theorem is that uh, there exists uh, uniform, there exists a constant. I'll call it uh, C. Uh, and actually, we can say, I mean, you can say what it is. It's, it's, it's less than 100. I mean, it's very explicit. Uh, so there's some constant uh, so that uh, the distance, so that the sum of non-annular projections pi y p2 this is like 50 everything here is very explicit is less than or equal to um, where the multiplicative and additive error on this less than or equal to sign is 100 it's c the distance in the pants graph. So in other words, there's two inequalities in, in the main theorem, and we only need the factorial growth in one of them. The other one is totally unique. OK. OK. So um, we, we actually use this. We use this to show that things could get very bad. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you try to build a pair of pants decompositions that have many, many different uh, large subsurface projections, where what is large? Large means at least 51. And this tells you, independent of the surface that you're on, that those pants decompositions have to be far away. Right? So, uh, so if I do that, I'll build a pair of pants decompositions that are actually quite far away in, in, the, in the pants graph. But if I can do it so that all the projections are still like less than 55, then if I put a 55 here, I'm still going to get 0 in this sum. So just to be very explicit. So there exists uh, pants decompositions p1 and p2 so that 1, the distance in the pants graph is at least some exponential function in the Euler characteristic. But uh, every subsurface projection is less than 55. Okay, So um, it's sort of like you're building up distance in a bunch of subsurfaces, but not so much distance that it starts to be um, picked up by this sum when you put a number bigger than 55 here, but still enough so that it is picked up and gives you distance. And you have to be a bit. Um, you have to juggle a lot of different subsurfaces to do this because I'm looking for basically uh, exponentially many subsurfaces on which this happens. And so I can't just do the, the standard thing that I drew on the board earlier where I take a bunch of subsurfaces that are all sort of disjoint and I break up the surface into a bunch of small chunks and do it there. The surfaces have to be crashing through each other in the right way. Um, but the bottom line is that part of how we show bad behavior is by showing good behavior in other places. Um, so um, there's more to say, but um, I think I'll stop there because I don't want to get into too many more details. So thank you very much.